Welcome to the milk bar. 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 Welcome along to episode 696 of The Milk Bar. Jason Forrest here with you as ever. And, and back to normal surroundings. It's been a, a bit of a, a mad few weeks for me and my family. Sadly, my mum passed away last week. And uh, uh, during the time of his during hospital, uh, seemed to have been a bit here, there and everywhere. And uh, I'm going to absolutely miss us. something rotten. Those of you who will uh, uh, watch the end of the credits on the video version of the podcast last week will have seen the tribute that we paid there. But uh, so. Um, having lost both my mom and dad in just under 12 months, uh, it's been a hugely difficult time for me and the uh, the rest of my family. So uh, I thank you for all who've expressed their condolences, uh, colleagues and uh, contributors alike over the uh, the last few days. So thanks to them for that. Coming up on the show this week, uh, one of our regular contributors, Ian Henry, will be along. Uh, he is now poet in residence at 101.8 WCRFM. So we'll be having a bit of a chat about that and he'll be sharing a poem with us. We'll be hearing from Tony Daly as he has a book out called The Daily Record, uh, a chance to, to look back on his time in football. And there's obviously plenty more still to come. He's uh, involved in uh, fitness and the like to this day. He's got coaching qualifications, spent time at Wolves and Villa, uh, both player. And uh, then, of course, his time at Wolves as coach and everything else that he does. So we'll be talking a bit about that. Uh, we'll be hearing about the film Purple Beats from its star, playing Issy. Uh, it's a, a bit of a, a romantic comedy all about the, uh, the dub music See, which is uh, going to be good to hear. So uh, we've got uh, that one on the way. Uh, we will also be hearing about the Extreme Magic Show appearing at Wolverhampton's Grand Theatre. So that's going to be well worth a look too. And uh, we've got much more besides. <laughs> On the 31st of October is Halloween and there will be extreme magic at Wolverhampton's Grand Theatre. Somebody who's part of that show and has already given us a taste of the amazing magic he can produce when he was in Panto in Sleeping Beauty in 2018 is Richard Cadell, who joins me now. Hello, sir. Hello. Gee, it doesn't seem uh, four or five years ago since I was at the Grand and that, it was a fabulous panto. I had such a happy time there, and I can't wait to go back. Well, yeah, no, and uh, we love the panto too. And uh, I remember when I interviewed you, and I was attacked by a small yellow bear that you have an awful lot to do with. Uh, but uh, yeah, on the receiving end of the water pistol. But I, th I think that's a badge of honour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, but nothing could be further from the sooty show in the show that I'm bringing, or we are bringing, to the Grand on Halloween night. This is uh, extreme magic, so it's nothing like sooty and sweet. <laughs> but in itself, though, uh, this is going to be hugely entertaining. As I say, we all, we've already seen some of the magic you do. I was shocked because I didn't know you did magic. And we find you now behind the scenes with all sorts of props around you. So yeah. tell us a, a bit about the, the, the show itself and what we can expect, because there's you and some amazing colleagues too. Bless you. Yes. It's, well, it's going to be edge of your seat, thrilling magic. So this is a combination of circus skills and illusion. So genuine danger but still very entertaining, some great laugh out loud moments because there's a whole cast of us. You know, so I'm doing some big spectacular illusions. Uh, John Archer's making everybody laugh, but blowing the mind at the same time. We have Lance Corporal Richard Jones, incredible mind reader, winner of Britain's Got Talent, and flown mm. in from Spain, Arcadio, the most fantastic manipulator, and then Solange from Portugal doing her quick change and some wonderful magic. It's a fantastic show. It moves like lightning, but it's edge of the seat stuff, thrilling. And I, th I think this is what we need in theatre, isn't it? Because you can see this sort of stuff on TV and you go, yeah, it's all tricks and cameras. When it's actually there on stage in front of you, you know you've got talented performers making this magic happen. And it is this pure skill. There isn't any trickery. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that, well, there is trickery. It's just well, we yeah. hope you can't spot it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And, and people have seen so much magic now on television through Britain's Got Talent. It has reawakened their love of magic. But you have to, you've nailed it. When you're in the theatre and the motorcycle vanishes in the middle of the air or, you know, a girl is cut into eight pieces and you are feet away from it, 
then that you can, you know, the wow and factor is, is incredible because you know, as you say, that we're not cutting to any camera angles. We're not cheating. We're not sneaking people out the back when the camera's not looking. It's real. And um, we've got the, honestly, all the shows come from Vegas. All the illusions are this from the David Copperfield workshops. This is unlike anything that's been in the UK before and will probably never happen again. This is a sort of a very short tour. Um, the producers brought together some, some incredible performers and, um, it looks sensational. Pyrotechnics, lasers, lights, you know, all the all the Vegas dressings. It, it's all here. It's absolutely got it all. And and the thing is, I mean, uh, I mean, I say I didn't realise, you know, you did a lot of magic. But actually, I think magic was your first appearance on the Sooty Show back in the day, wasn't it? You were a magician as a kid. You've done your homework. In fact, I tell a little story in this show. I, I put, I, there was one magic trick that I was famous for, uh, or became not famous for, became known for when I was back in my early 20s. And... Because of this trick, I, I got to perform with a lot of people, and that's where I met Matthew Corber and, and, and my path crossed with Sooty. So uh, it was a career, a game changer for me, and I'm performing that illusion again in this show as a tribute to kind of where it all began. And it, it, it's, um, yeah, you're right. So magic left has led me to Sooty, and now I'm back doing magic as well as Sooty. Yeah, well, it's great, though, and I think it, it's... Shows how, and you are a hard working performer, and I think it, it's people you know, will really get that from this show. I mean, having seen you in Panto, I know just how blooming hard you work, but it, I think it, this is next level, and yeah, and, and people don't see the hard bit, they <laughs> see the fun bit. I mean, I'm just going to give you a quick flip around here. You can see uh, all this. I mean, this, this is we've got two 40 foot Arctic lorries here <laughs> that 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 start life full. We bring all this equipment into the theatre. Um, there's loads behind me. And I mean, I've just, you talk about graft. I've, this is a, you can see this, this is a, a heavy lifting winch and it goes wire ropes all the way up into the ceiling. And I rig that myself in order that I can be lifted in the air at one point of the show um, on a burning rope, trying to get out of a straight jacket before these do. steel jaws <laughs> slam shut. Yeah. And, and, one thing I wanted to just mention that I think is special about the Wolverhampton Grand, A, it's the last night of our tour, but B, um, the Houdini straitjacket escape. We're doing it on, on, the, on the anniversary of his death because Houdini died on Halloween um, famously. From, so, so this is a very poignant moment to try and recreate um, something that Harry Houdini was famous for, but in slightly more... Uh, nerve-wracking situations, I suppose you could say. Absolutely, and uh, I think this this is part of it. You, you're going to get a show like no other. I don't think there's anything else touring like this at the moment, is there at all? There's never been anything like this in the UK. There's lots of magic shows. Yeah, yeah. You get there and they're fantastic, and it's a guy with a pack of cards, and some other guy might do something where maybe they do one box or one illusion, but you don't get 24 illusions and five performers and Vegas, you know, eight dancers. I mean, not in, not for a one nighter. It doesn't happen. I've been in the business all my life. I've never been in a show like this. I've dreamed of being in shows like this. I've watched shows like this in Las Vegas. Um, you know, this is a one off. This is uh, this is a producer with a huge passion for magic, not worried about numbers financially. This is about putting on the best show he can. And and um, and, and there's been no expense spared, no expense. I mean, there's a massive crew team that you never see. That are pulling all the triggers, making the sparks fly out. We've got flame machines, smoke. I mean, there's so much happening behind the scenes. I mean, this is a massive team. It's not just five people. There's 20 odd people touring in this show. Um, it, it's it's and and more importantly, I could just it's going to the Grand, which is the most <laughs> beautiful theatre. You, you're just it's such a beautiful, beautiful place to put the show. So. Yeah, I'm so excited to get back there. Well, it would be amazing. It's going to be awesome having you there. It is, as we say, Halloween, the 31st of October, 2022. It is 01902429212 for the box office or pop along to grandtheatre.co.uk to get your tickets. But uh, we can find you online as well, can we? Where would be our best place to see what you're up to? Well, I mean, the easiest place is just to search Extreme Magic on Facebook. Extreme as in X, the letter X, Extreme Magic. Or all the information, if you can remember this one, is on shownproductions.co.uk. And shown is H S H O N E productions.co.uk. There's tour pictures, uh, there's the tour list, and there's lots of info about performers. But uh, just Google it, it'll all pop up. 
But or of course on the grand the website yeah, on the grand, grand the grand's grand, own website will have yeah, stuff. Yeah, there's links there too. But grandtheatre.co.uk, get your tickets that way. You can find out more about the show. But I mean, I think you've covered all of that's there and more for the fact that we've seen a bit of what's going on behind the scenes as well. For me, that's yeah. been amazing, and we're looking forward to having you in the city on Halloween with an absolutely awesome show. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye. Footballing legend Tony Daly has a brand new book out and he's on the line now to tell me what he's been writing about. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Fine, thanks, Jason. Yourself? Oh, I'm, I'm coping just about getting by. And uh, I mean, life is busy. And I mean, since your departure from Wolves and then reappearance at Wolves, and I remember seeing you doing an awful lot of coaching back in my day down there, as well as obviously having seen you play. But uh, it, it, there's been a, a load more going on as well. What have you been up to of late? Yes, um, uh, I said once I'd left Walls, I'd set up a, a business um, in the fitness industry where I'm doing uh, one-to-one uh, coaching uh, with not only um, elite athletes, professional footballers, but also the public as well. So it, it stems that way. Um, so I've, I've been doing that for the last five years, really enjoying it. It's been fantastic being able to, you know, to see an array of different people and help so many people. Also, as well, in that meantime, as well, in between COVID and that, I decided to write a little autobiography, a little book. But I mean, you've got an awful lot of stories to tell. And uh, I mean, for the Midlands football scene, this is going to be uh, not so much an expose, but an amazing sort of romp through some brilliant history and, and good times at, at both clubs, even though, you know, the world of football can be rather fickle. Yeah, it has been. You know, uh, I would always say I had a fantastic career. Yes, it was cut short with injury and everything else. And but it's nice to actually sit back and uh you know relive some of the stories i mean a lot of stories i got from from a younger age as well i had to have help from uh ex-colleagues friends uh family in terms of things that happen you know it, throughout my career because i initially thought well i've got to write about type of thing as well and going through it and uh looking back it was it was it was it was great really and as you said about some really really good times in football football's been really great for me and i'm you know i'm so humbled and pleased being able to have the career that i've had when it comes to the, the title, the, the Daily Record, I, I, I'm liking the play on words there. That is working. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, it is about putting on record so much. And, and I mean, you, you already said there, there, there's been help along the way. But uh, I, I th- hopefully, I, I think most people know you're, you're quite a humble man, but have done amazing things. And, and it must be interesting trying to balance that out. Because, I, 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 again, I, I know what you've, you've done and I know the brilliant work you've done behind the scenes in coaching, etc., and, and 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 working with 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 players, so you know it it must be great to be able to put some of that down and share those stories and 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 get other colleagues' input as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been great, as he said. You know, I've, I've uh, in terms of terms of my football my football life, I've just told it as it was. It in terms <laughs> of it was, yes, you, you know, I need a bit of uh, prompting and stuff like that because I, I, I had I said I had a career where football was meant everything to me so this was part and parcel of my life going and doing my coaching career was part and parcel it was, a, it was a normal normal step for me so it, it did take a bit of um, edging and flowing to get you know more story not more some stories more emphasis on the stories and I'm thinking well that's yeah that did happen and everything else and realize that perhaps when you sit back and go yeah wow you know some some of the things, some of the people I've met, some of the stories I've got to tell. Um, not not only uh, during my football career, but also as well. You know my my uh, ten years I had at Wolves as a uh, football coach as well. You know so again, uh, so there's some interesting things in the book as well that that uh, for me was great to relive. And, and of course, obviously, with your time at the Wolves. There's, uh, there's, there's better be some background stories which are, are going to be fun that you're able to share. And again, it, it brings to life a, a period in Wolves history. And I, I, have you got any magical moments from, from Molyneux that you go into full detail in the book you want to give us a bit of a flavour of now? I mean, I, I think as well, uh, what I found interesting was, I mean, I've, I've gone into a little detail of fact, uh, the amount of manager I've worked under, but initially coming to Wolves at first and... Um, the furore it was not only with the fans as well uh, and myself coming back as a fitness coach which everyone found really really ironic and I, <laughs> you know, the fact that you know the fact that uh, my career was, uh, was cut, sort of curtailed through injury there and I would say through no fault of my own you know because I was at the peak of my career at that time and wanted to achieve as much as I can and help bring Wolves back into the premiership but it never worked that way um, but the fact that, you know, Wolves fans go, well, why are we getting someone who's been injured? You know, he's sick notes and everything else. 
but my story to tell was with that was that you know it's it's uh, a career that I, I took upon something I was always been interested in fitness in terms of that you know I went off to university got my degrees and um, something that I'd always wanted to pursue but also something I had to offer as well to realize that you know for someone who's had the injuries I've had as well I relate I can I can relate to getting players fit and help them get fit and you know all the times I had all those injuries uh, some of the stuff I had to do to get fit. So, you know, when a player was injured and they're going for a bad spell as well, it wasn't just the physical side of helping them, but um, mentally as well. Mm-hmm. You know, having, you know, the empathy to what what those players, players were going through. You can only speak to Matt Jarvis as well. You know, Matt Jarvis went through a, a really, really bad spell of injuries because before he, he, he peaked with Wolves and, and you know, and have played a small part in helping him get through that as well. You know, not just on, you know, helping him physically as well, but being able to talk to him about, you know, the times that I had as well and be related, I think really helped him. So, you know, have played a small part in that really helped. So that side, um, I, I think, was was fantastic for me. Um, mm-hmm. um, something I really, really enjoyed. I mean, you've got to realise that um, when I realised my career is coming to an end at Wolves, you know, being injured virtually three of the four years that I was there, it was something that I thought, hang on a minute, you know, I had to look at what career I was going to do. And coming back for me as well, when I had opportunities to come back under Mick McCarthy as a fitness coach as well, it was for me something like um, payback, you know, <laughs> being able to not being able to do it um, as, a, as a player. Uh, being able to play some uh, small part in um, some very good successes I had in my ten years at Wolves as a as a uh, fitness coach. Well, yeah, and you, know, you were always one of the the, the popular lads, uh, both you know, when you're playing days and uh, in in your days back as the, the fitness coach. And, but yeah, people have always liked you. You're a, you're a nice bloke. You're always helpful, and uh, you know you, you've always been there for people. And I think. That sort of thing is remembered as well, and uh, you know, if, when you you go back and and you look back over your career and and where you are now, I think it just shows what yeah. You, know, you think of Tony Daly, you think nice bloke, always had his his passion at heart, and then and and that is something which I'm sure comes out in the book as well. I think so. I mean, it's good for you to say that, case as well. But you know, that's that, I've always been brought up that way as well. Do you know, um, to respect people, you know, if they respect me, to respect people the same as well, and to give. When I do something to give whole lightly back, and you know what, I'm kind of person who always wants to try and help people as best I can. You know, if I can't help them, I point in the direction of people who can. That's always been always been my nature. Mm-hmm. And you know, when it was effortless, effortless view, if you read the book, and it comes across that way, it wasn't a thing I was trying to portray. It's something that that's me, as I said before. How the book, how the book reads, and everything else is is how I am and, and and nothing will change that the way I, the way I am you know mm-hmm. I mean in terms of uh, with, with players as it says yes uh, okay yes very nice and everything else but you know when it gets to get work done the work gets done and I yeah. think well you know with, with, with players as well the, they don't say it's in the NASA side of me they've seen the side of me where go oh, there's you know there's a time to work and a time to play so I'll, even though I have got that streak in me I never had had to use it because they knew when it's work time, it's work time because they responded to the way, uh, you know, I worked. And as a as a player as well at Wolves, I mean, I had some fantastic times at Wolves, even through the injury. Um, I can I've gone on record and said this, the during the time as, as a player when I was injured there, all the staff, the players, and fans as well. The majority of fans I would say as well were fantastic with me as well. It's all I wanted to do was you know be there, having been a record signing there. Um, and let me tell you something, myself, and I could talk about Steve Frogger as well. We were at the peak of our careers. Um, mm. You, you know, if I've got to say, if we were fit, the likes of Stevie Ball's injured, there had Dunkelman injuries, Jeff Thompson, uh, uh, Thomas had injuries as well. There was, you know, I think there was probably uh, seven or eight of um, the signings that um, Graham Taylor made who were injured. And if we had the team we had, there's no doubt that this, t- this team would have gone and, and, and been a force and gone and, pl- and been in that Premier League that first yeah. season. Yeah, well, I- I'm proud to say I was there to watch at the time and see the, uh, the, the likes of the boys you're talking about on the pitch. We had a, uh, a great time watching some good football. It never, say, it didn't quite make it to where I think they, the, the, uh, the power and the passion deserve to be. But the stories around all of this are in your book, The Daily Record. How do we get hold of a copy? Yeah, and um, you can get it uh, via the publishers, uh, Morgan Morgan Lawrence Publishing, uh, uh, for a link there. Um, um, 
you can get it from there. You can also get it from uh, uh, Amazon and any good bookshop. Oh, so that's a phrase you've been hoping to say for a good while. Well, you well deserve an amazing success of this. Let's have a great Christmas and this appearing in many people's Christmas stockings. Uh, but for now, Tony Daly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Jason. Great speaking to you. 101.8 WCRFM has a brand new poet in residence for the first time. Uh, it's somebody who we all know about because we've shared his poetry with you in the past. It's Ian Henry. How are you doing? Hi, Jason. Jason, how are you? You're looking well. You're looking good on the radio. <laughs> yeah, this is it. We're on a Zoom call, so we can actually see each other, which is quite nice. Uh, and uh, I do note that uh, you're currently uh, injured at the minute, and uh, a little incident with the collarbone during a bit of uh, uh, sparring, I believe. Yeah, my mother always says I've only got the face for radio, but here we are on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, um, I do a lot of martial arts, and unfortunately I thought I was Jackie Chan. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't get injured leaping over chairs and tables and doing forward rolls uh, and coming up in fighting positions. Uh, I was doing it all night without any problems, getting ready for my next grade grading in Krav Maga martial arts. And unfortunately, the very last move that I did, I messed up my technique. I fractured my clavicle in my right shoulder and I'm, <laughs> I'm right-handed and I'm in a lot of pain and my arm's going to be in a sling for eight weeks, and I'm gutted. I'm gutted not because I've got a, a broken shoulder, a fractured clavicle, but because I can't drive, I can't go anywhere, I'm having to do everything one hand. And do you know what, Jason? I give my right hand to be ambidextrous. <laughs> no, dear. Right, keep that arm still then. Stop damaging yourself. Uh, and explain a bit more about what it's going to be like being poet in residence, because uh, I, I, it is something which has become hugely fashionable. And I, I know you've been poet laureate uh, for Warsaw for a while, and uh, they've uh, enjoyed your work that way. But uh, it, it, it is a, a, a good not only fun thing to do, but uh, but also it can bring the thought and meaning to uh, a, a lot of organisations and, and allow them to be reflective in the right way. Well, that's right. I mean, there's poet in residence uh, all over for various things. There's been a poet in residence uh, for um, West Midlands Travel. There's been a poet in residence at Whittick Manor here in Wolverhampton. And I was invited to join the board of WCRFM as legal director. Uh, and it's, it's a voluntary position, but... People don't realise that uh, at WCRFM um, it's sustained by over 10,000 voluntary hours per year. We do it because we want to serve Wolverhampton. We want to promote the various diverse sections of our community. Uh, the real heroes of WCRFM are people like you, Jason, the presenters who get up and do the shows and promote Wolverhampton's one and only radio station. Because all the changes in commercial radio and the British Broadcast Company, Wolverhampton, WCRFM, is the only radio station in Wolverhampton. And I wanted to add to that, we're a team, all of us are a team. So when I was invited by the board to be legal director, it meant that I could serve the presenters, it meant I could serve the community in a different capacity. And I said to the board, how else can I add value to what we do at WCRFM? And I was invited to be poet in residence, and I took up the opportunity because it means that I can promote what we do and the community in the forthcoming Wolverhampton Literature Festival. And I'm excited about that. We've got two projects coming up, uh, the Manda Centre Community Hub and Whittick Manor. So this is going to be a chance to have poetry out there in the wild in Wolverhampton in a way it's never been done before. And also to be able to share it on the radio too, which I think is quite uh, exciting. I'm looking forward to the fact that that is going to be a possibility. And uh, that said, I, I kind of have to ask, uh, with your left hand, have you penned any poems at the moment? Um, I can stab at, stab at the keys on a keyboard. <laughs> so anything you wish to share today? Well, could I share the poem that I wrote for National Poetry Day, uh, which is on WCRFM's website. Mm -hmm. uh, the theme for National Poetry Day was the environment. And I wrote this for WCRFM and it's called Acorn. Could I share it, please? Take it away. It's called Acorn and it goes like this. Gilded October leaves blow through ancient forest. Anxious birds carried over miles of unspoilt land pulsing with life before disappearing under the bulldozer's shovel. Mist lay over the forest, then winter snow, 
acorn weights, fit to burst, march, a pale root finger grope the dark leaf mold, an acorn tip thrust, a probing stalk towards the sun, a green periscope breaking out on the surface, the root examine the rich soil like a snail's horn, reveling in spring air, gentle rain and yellow primroses splashed on decaying leaves. The human insanity of wars and persecutions were irrelevant. Birds had sung in the temple of leaves that was now an oak. What else mattered? Butterflies and wood warblers laid their eggs under its protection. Badgers built their set among the roots and one ivy berry became a warm trust for birds the following winter. The forest was broken up into enclosures for farming. Wild bogs and heathlands brought under the plough. Trees chopped down, harmless wild creatures and plants condemned to death. Forest vanished, humans slaughtered beautiful wildlife for fun in the wood. No cuckoo note sounded, only in the noisy barking of dogs, the monotonous bellowing of sullen cows in endless fields and the roar of the motorway pumping out diesel. Smog lay over the desert lands, smelling like old cabbages, shrouding the tower blocks of concrete and glass, reflecting stale canals, coursing through scarred earth of industrial ruin. In the little glade, the old oak was tired and ready to fall like a leaf back to the soil to become part of the earth where it had been born. After enduring centuries, it still had an acorn left, its last. Thank you. Excellent work and uh, uh, nicely reflective. And, and in some ways, we can, we can all see bits of that in the world around us. I mean, if you think of Rook Wood in my native Willenhall, uh, you know, you've got um, a motorway which literally it now borders and cuts straight through it back in what must have been, I think I'm going to get to 60s, the M6 went in uh, with the work that was done there. And uh, it, 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 we need to make sure we're thinking of our environment and certainly that uh, gives us a, a excellent food for thought. And... I'm sure we'll be reflecting on many events that come up in the, the Wolverhampton calendar. We've got uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to welcome you on, on air as, as part of the team, which is going to be amazing. And uh, it'll be good to have you along. And uh, hopefully you can share on Wolverhampton today your new poems as we go into uh, these special events. So that will be absolutely fantastic. And uh, I, I, just, yeah, I, I know... Not only through your, your work, so you, you joined as legal director, and I, I know that for many, many years, uh, you've also made sure that you've given back to the communities that you serve. And uh, I think that that's a big part of the ethos that is Ian Henry. And uh, uh, again, this is another opportunity uh, for, for you to do what you've, you've always done. You've always had that, uh, you know, that community spirit behind you, whether it be through your poetry work or whether it's through your, 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 your day job, as it were. Thank you, Jason. Well, at WCRFM, we're all part of a team. It just means I can support the team members, means I can support the presenters, people like your good self, uh, and help them and help Wolverhampton. Uh, it's an unpaid role, uh, but if it means helping the community like you help the community, Jason, then it's a win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great talking to you. Thank you for sharing some poetry today. Um, I look forward to more, as I say, in the not too distant future. And uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, books and the like that we can continue to talk about as we have done for what? The best part of a decade now, I think, I've, uh, I've been having uh, interviews with you on air. It's been my pleasure. Thank Never you. a chore, always a pleasure. <laughs> Ian Henry, once again, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Verbal Beats is a coming-of-age drama. It's released on Halloween, the 31st of October, and the star is Izzy Jones, who joins me now. Hello. Hello. Now, this has got some amazing music, uh, a brilliant storyline, and it must have been great to really get your teeth into telling this tale. Yeah, it was... I was really excited, actually, when I read it, um, because it's not very often you get to dig in to a character who I really, I really, um, really connected to really kind of understood where she was where she came from and what she wanted to do and mm -hmm. the music as well so well, yeah, yeah I mean, it was fun. You, 
you're reliving the drum and bass scene of the 1990s. And I have to be, I'm old enough to have uh, heard some of this escaping into the Midlands at the time. And, and there were some amazing bands who really, I mean, drum, drum and bass just, just worked so well, didn't it? From, uh, from, from that point forward, it was kind of, it's almost magical music from uh, that, that somehow sprung from the urban scene from nowhere and, and, and really just touched so many souls. Mm, yeah, it's, it's so it's funny because um, I sadly kind of missed the era, but um, Lola, this film was kind of like my entrance into into the drama based world. So <laughs> I still got it. I still got that kind of like entrance into it. But I do really like drama base. Um, Lola talks about uh, that that was that was definitely just her world, and it sounds like an absolute hoot. To be honest, <laughs> it sounds like. <laughs> it really took off and it was really exciting to be part of that new wave of music that kind of captured so many different genres and became its own thing as well. But but one that spoke to even more people than before, obviously the 90s were, were indie rock in, in many parts of the world. Mm. Oasis were doing their thing, we had Blur. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole scene, when it came down to it, probably raw music, I would say, it was, it was really at, at the roots of what I not only felt good to listen to, but also to move to as well. Mm, yeah, when I was doing um, the research, I was uh, I was so taken by the dance, the the kind of like drum and bass style <laughs> movement. Yeah, um, that was really fun to capture in the film as well. Just that, just moving like they did in the nineties, um, was slightly different to now, but uh, yeah, it was good fun. And uh, obviously, uh, a female led cast and crew, which is uh, uh, unfortunately it's still novel, but that in itself <laughs> helps to tell this story, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. It was a it was a real treat working working with the team. Um, Lola, Violetta, just some great vision. Um, and yeah, it, it is. It's one of those things that it shouldn't be special, but it does it, it does feel special to be able to do female led stuff. And I'm sure there'll be loads more. Um, there is loads more out now. Um, so it was really exciting to be part of that as 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 kind of lead actor. Yeah, and I mean you've got a, a brilliant team as well. Uh, the producer Jason Matthewson, award-winning uh, uh, actor, producer, and writer, and I think that again adds something to the whole genre when it's somebody who knows what they want on screen because they know how to give it on screen too. Definitely, definitely, it was a real. It, the joy of the film was it was a real collaboration of of brains um, and different people's skills as well. So uh, yeah, the whole thing the whole thing really came together in a in quite an exciting way but in in a very shaky time as well you know we had COVID and everything um mm-hmm. uh, so it was kind of it, the the film came together like SJ she kind of pushed pushed through and made its mark and and created something when when times were a bit um rocky so so give us yeah. one of the intricacies of your character that you may not pick up until you've seen the film twice because it's one that people are going to go back to and see twice but sometimes it's 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 those extra little bits that you don't realize until the end of the film so what should we be looking out for as you travel through no no spoilers but how do you how do you see your character um oh that's a good question i i would say um mainly because I'm very proud of, of the little ditties that I created for the film. So uh, some of the songs, maybe you can pick them out. You probably won't be able to, but some of the songs in the film I, I wrote, um, specifically one that was a collaboration uh, with a drum and bass track as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so as a character, that's quite a, a pivotal moment for SJ. And because you're both living it at well. the same time, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did live it at the same time. And the, the magic of that moment was uh, it was the first time anyone had heard it. Um, it was a big crowd, which is a bit of a clue, a big crowd. And, and I, I went out and sung it and it was it just all came together. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was it was like I lived that um, in real time. Uh, and we were able so to that get along. That was, I like that as well. And I think uh, that being able to be part of that. And um, is there a soundtrack to to go along with this? Because it's all we can, we can download a playlist on, so we can we can enjoy this music uh, outside of the film too. 
Well, not currently, but um, there has been talks of potentially um, re-recording some of the songs, mm -hmm. um, getting some of them uh, into a playlist where, where people can listen. But yeah, that, that would definitely be uh, something that I would want to go yeah. for. <laughs> I, th I, th I think that there's more life in this project, isn't there, even after the film and, and um, the great reception it's had already. Yeah, it's had a really lovely reception. The, 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 the screening at BFI was lush. Um, had a really nice warm reception and people connecting to the drum and bass. And I think it's quite nostalgic for a lot of people. Um, and the music as well. And I, I was really, I was really chuffed to see how it's, how it's come together. And I'm excited for more people to see it. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what life it kind of takes on. Well, yes, it, it, it becomes a video on demand on the 31st of October. It is one to, to look out for. Uh, we are looking for purple, P-U-R-P-L-E, the standard spelling of purple, mm -hmm. beats with a Z on the end, uh, very much mm -hmm. like your headphones. Uh, and yeah. uh, it is going to be uh, a great to bring so many more people into a, a rich genre of music, which I don't think always gets as much credit today as it should do, but it really was uh at, at its inception something which which changed lives and communities mm. yeah that it was um lola said earlier she she was saying how it, it it had its time and then it kind of seemed to to fade out but there is hope i believe i believe that there's potentially a resurgence of it and it's coming back in a new way in new forms um but it's that thing of can you ever quite capture the the initial the initial breakout of it of well, the sound but... fingers crossed it'll be fingers your track crossed. that gets released that will make <laughs> that happen so that would be good to see that would be uh, absolutely awesome as i say it is purple absolutely. beats 31st of october make sure you're there izzy jones thank you for joining us and uh continued success with uh, the rest of your work and maybe even that full full-on songwriting career that follows just now <laughs> thank you very much yeah we'll see we'll see <laughs> With winter drawing in, it's about time we sorted out a few things in the garden so it is ready for 2023 and hopefully a glorious spring ahead of us. Somebody who can give us a few tips. Uh, you'll know him as a TV presenter, author, uh, Michael Perry, possibly, but certainly as Mr. Plank Geek. And he joins me now to tell me more. Hello, sir. Hey, how you doing? I'm all right. And I hope we find you well and preparing yourself for the winter months. Absolutely. But I was so disappointed because there was some research hippo that told me only two percent of people garden in the winter and i was like how is this because for many years i've been talking about planting bare root plants pruning your roses clearing your waste winter is the best time to garden don't be the 30 percent that wait until spring because when you get to spring you know that first hot weekend in 2023 you're going to suddenly want to get out there garden you're going to buy all the plants that are already in flower it's too late. You want to start planning now. Wrap up warm, soak up the vitamin D, plan the garden, mulching, planting. Winter is the key gardening season. Yeah, and when it comes down to getting things ready, it's, it's sort of like ordering seeds for the spring as well. Getting the, the bulbs ready and in place, some want planting now, others will be later. But it, it, it's, it's worthwhile preparing yourself for all of this. And most importantly, it's a bit of pruning that can be done. Oh, totally. So good time of year if you want to get better flowers on your roses. Good time of year to prune your roses. Pruning fruit trees, key time of year if you want to have bumper crops on those. But also a great time of year to plant roses and bare roots and also bare root perennials. You know, a bare root plant is basically the plant once it's out of the container without the compost. This is the raw material of the plant. And planting that while it's dormant in the winter months can give you so many benefits. First of all, it is cheaper because you're not paying for the pot, you're not paying for the compost, but also you're planting the plant while it's dormant. So it establishes a lot easier. We always wait until the spring and we buy a plant that's already in flower in the garden center and it's probably already past its best. So why not plan ahead, plant the bare roots, plant seeds as well. You know, even if it's cold and rainy outside, you could sit inside in a comfy armchair and plan out your garden order your seeds you know ever since i've been young i've loved that kind of yearly seed order putting it in choosing what i'm going to buy getting all the top offers as well so yeah it's a great time of year to just garden at your own pace you yeah know, don't and, wait until spring 
Yeah, that is that is a big part because it means when spring does come, there's you've got a good chance to be able to sit outside on a nice spring day and enjoy a cuppa in the garden compared to having to dig that bed that which needs yep. doing. So you know, it, it's a, a much better way of, of exactly. using your time, particularly when you've got nothing else to do at this time of year, yeah. maybe except think about Christmas shopping. I know, I know it is. And just wrap up warm, you know, don't go out there when it's like cold and rainy, but when it's cold and it's clear, those are the most gorgeous days of the year. Think about wildlife as well. Think about maybe that dreaded shed tidy up because we all let our sheds get very messy <laughs> over the summer. Maybe it's time to, you know, get yourself a hippo bag and sort out what is in that shed once and for all. Maybe there's a few things you can sell on, maybe a few things you can give to friends, but most importantly, you can actually put most of that stuff in a hippo bag and 95% of it will be diverted from landfill. You don't even need to sort it for recycling. So it makes it so easy. Yeah, and uh, of course, obviously, uh, sometimes our uh, garden waste collections halt over the uh, the winter months too. And uh, you're going to use as much as you can on the compost heap, I'm absolutely sure. But there'll be some bits from maybe some of the pruning, which does need to go away. And again, the, uh, the hippo bag can be used for that sort of stuff too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, I mean, anything like if you've got like fallen leaves, you can actually pack those into bags and use them to create mulch, which is great for borders. But anything kind of bigger like branches, they're not necessarily going to compost down. It could be you've just got random things that are sitting around your garden in the sheds. You know, I know what gardens get like over the summer. There's always little bits here. Maybe you're replacing a fence or, you know, some of that kind of winter garden maintenance have the hippo bag by your side and there's there's no sorting, there's no sitting there trying to squish everything into the bin. And you're right, they don't always take those bins all through the year as well. You need to check with your local council for that. Yeah, and uh, uh, of course, in the shed are probably all those really flimsy, virtually unusable pot, pots that the, the plants came in you put in last year. So there, there, there isn't much to do with those other than get them recycled. Yeah, so some of those you can use them for maybe three or four years, but at some point they will start to split down the sides. So it's perhaps more sustainable, more responsible to then, you know, actually send those to be recycled and maybe look into a more sustainable type of pot. There's a few new ones on the market, such as wool pots or rubber pots as well. So maybe this is also a good time of year to kind of review the way that you garden as well. So mm -hmm. it's a good time all year round. And it keeps you busy because, yeah, like you does. say, what else is there to do? <laughs> but also, you need to make sure your plants are ready. Now, sometimes this involves uh, wrapping them in, uh, in in special materials uh -huh. to keep them warm. Yeah, absolutely. So, twenty four percent of people we found didn't know that they can protect a lot of winter plants. <clears throat> so it could be that you're growing a banana tree that's going to need some winter protection. It could be you've got something quite exotic, like a bougainvillea, for example. Make sure they're protected with fleece old neck curtains, maybe a piece of blanket, or in the case of plants like hydrangea, fuchsias, you can actually protect them with themselves. And by that, I mean, don't prune them back too soon. Leave that network of growth that actually protects the plants over the winter months. So hydrangeas, penstemons, fuchsias, you prune those in the spring, not in the autumn. So lots of great tips there. Where can we get more tips from you? And of course, find out about the hippo bag that will help us take away the bits yeah, we don't so need. So hippowaste.co.uk will tell you more about those bags. Remember, 95% is diverted from landfill, which is perfect. You'll find out more about me online, which is Mr. Underscore Plant Geek. Loads of tips, whatever the season. That's the way to do it. And uh, probably a bit of video footage of you actually doing the work so we know exactly what to do. But you can't, there's no excuse. You can't just watch uh, uh, Michael work. You actually have to do some of it yourself. <laughs> Michael Ferry, TV presenter, author, and of course, as you say, Mr. Plank Geek, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks all for this week. Once again, thanks for being along. It'd be good to have you along for episode 697 next week. Hope to see you then. Meanwhile, have a fantastic week as best you can. Ta ra for now. Goodbye from the milk bar. 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 Yeah. Goodbye from the milk bar. Yeah.